there's dark moments, I think, for all ladies who are diagnosed as having breast cancer. But um, I think once they come through it, there is life after this diagnosis. He was like God to me. He was like God. Honestly, he'd saved, he'd stopped me from getting the cancer. He drugged me, operated on me, and cut bits off me. After a seven week trial, former breast surgeon Ian Patterson was jailed. The jury at Nottingham Crown Court found him guilty of 17 counts of wounding with intent. This is probably one of the biggest medical scandals ever to have hit this country. I really want to know, how did he get away with it? Why was he allowed to work for 20 years, harming people? Um, why haven't you done anything about that? It all began in 2003. It was coming up to Christmas. I was in the bath and I found it. A small hard lump, like a pea. I tried squeezing it, hoping it would go away, but it didn't. For a while I just sat there. The water got colder and colder. I just sat there holding my breast. I was 45. I just thought to myself, this can't be happening. I have three young kids, this can't be happening. So I went to the doctors. Luckily, I had private health care with my job, so she referred me to see Ian Patterson. An NHS consultant, Ian Patterson, ran a clinic in Parkway Private Hospital. Literally, as soon as I walked into Parkway, I was told by the receptionist and by the nurses, by everybody I made contact with, that I was lucky to have the best consultants in the area. The first thing I said to Patterson was, both my parents had just died of cancer, 2001 my mum and then 2002 my dad. I said that straight up. And then he talked about needed to take a sample with this needle. What he said to me was, look, the lump's got to come out. Um, come back to see me on Monday. I wrote a message to each of my kids, basically saying um, how much I love them and, you know, all the special attributes each one of them had, because I didn't think I'd potentially survive. So on the Monday, we are walking into Patterson's office. I'd literally just sat down when he said, your breast needs to come off. It's near the, the nipple, so it's all the connecting tissue. Um, you need a mastectomy. He said, you'll be fine. You'll go with me two boobs and come out with two boobs and a nice flat stomach. In my own mind, I thought, I am going to do whatever he says. This is the consultant. This is the person that's going to save my life. I thought I was so lucky to have all of these, you know, these people that were the best. And I've got my results back so quickly. Thank God I've got private cover. I thought, I am lucky. My operation was the 4th of December. So I wrote in my journal. Didn't sleep last night. I prayed that everything would be all right. I had a lot of faith in the operating team. Mr. Patterson, the chief surgeon, he had an excellent reputation. 7 a.m. the lights were put on. It was the plastic surgeon. She asked me to take my top off and to pull my trousers down below my waist. She then drew around both breasts marked a point on my neck, drew around my belly button, 
and then drew a line straight down the middle of my torso and around my waistline. After she'd left, I looked at myself in the mirror. I looked a bit like a patchwork quilt. The anaesthetist told me to think of something nice. I remember trying to think of the view of Dublin from the top of the Guinness building. But as I closed my eyes, I saw lots of birds flying up from a green field. Patterson operated out of two private hospitals, Parkway and Little Aston. Consultants are often not employed by private hospitals. If something goes wrong, the hospital may not have to accept liability. I started carving stone uh, when I retired as a consultant surgeon specializing in breast surgery. And there's many similarities between carving stone and, and breast surgery in that you have to take your time to do it correctly. I did all my private practice at Little Aston, which is where he worked. There were two theaters there and he was working in one and I was working in the other. They're totally independent, but uh, he was messy. <laughs> that little last manager did not try and manage you because all they were interested in those people who bring the most patients into the operating theatres. Mr. Patterson had a fixed list because they always had patients. My view was there was no overall supervision. Uh, in private practice, you hire a room from them, you have to pay room rent. You're not employed by them, so you're not managed by them. You'd like to say he was the fastest surgeon around. His patients would lose a lot more blood because he was rushing. If you rush, you, you don't get into the right plane and uh, therefore you get more bleeding and it's untidy. And it's, it's not good surgery, not in my opinion. From the early 90s, Ian Patterson had worked alongside a breast care nurse called Beth Ann Lloyd Owen. Together, they ran support clinics for breast cancer patients. The consultants inform the ladies as to what is happening, sort of, regarding their disease, really. His breast care nurse, Bethan, thought he was wonderful, but he was just infatuated with Ian. Ian was a, a very arrogant, very confident character. He had an air of authority. There's dark moments, I think, for all ladies who are diagnosed as having breast cancer. But um, I think once they come through it, the support group really helps them to realize that there is life after this diagnosis. They get their life back. Debbie had breast cancer, but there seemed to be no meaningful discussion with Ian Patterson and Beth Ann about her options beforehand. No talking through the risks or benefits of treatment. When I got diagnosed, I did a... I did this. I mean, it's coming off now. That was a water feature. After her mastectomy, there followed reconstructive surgery and 12 weeks of chemotherapy. To support her as she underwent her treatment, she joined a local cancer group. Breast Friends was inspired by Patterson's breast care nurse, Bethan. Patterson himself was also influential in setting up the group. He was a frequent speaker advising and lecturing the women on all aspects of breast cancer. After my chemo, um, I decided to go along. Uh, I'd started to lose my hair, so I put my cap on and um, went to a meeting and just really liked it straight away. It was so friendly and inviting. I then started fundraising. I got Tom Jones lookalike. That was my first fundraiser and I got co-opted onto the, the committee straight away. The fun run year was a regular thing. That was huge every year. Ian Patterson would turn up with his wife. I remember the one year, um, you know, Patterson and his wife dressed as Pinky and Perky. Bethan would bring her chocolate Labrador, Gordon, named after her favourite drink. Bethan actually got involved in the fundraising. She ran a, um, a ball every two years, the, a pink ball. Uh, Mr. Patterson would be the guest speaker at those events. You would see some of the women in front, they were like kind of gazing up as if he was a rock star. You had that element of, he was, he was God, because he saved my life, and that's how you felt about him.
Carroll was a regular Patterson patient. She saw him at his private clinic in Parkway every few months over a 13-year period. We ran the Bill and Ball pub for 26 and a half years. I got married at 16 to Barry, and we've been together ever since. He's still the one I'd marry again tomorrow, so... Yeah. Oh, how romantic. <laughs> I've got a history of breast lumps. It was on your mind all the time. Cancer, cancer, you know, this one is going to be it. We was in a private scheme through the pub. I was referred to Mr Patterson at Parkway. He looked at the mammograms and the scans. He says uh, to Barry, you're a very lucky man. Um, she's got uh, the breasts of a teenager, 18 year olds. He checked the lump and he said it had definitely got to come out. Over the next three years, Patterson operated on Carol three more times, each time telling her the lumps were bordering on cancer. We found the fifth one a couple of weeks before Christmas, and he said, it's a lump that's definitely got to come out. We kept it from the kids. All Christmas and New Year's Day. We told them. And then I went in on the 7th and had it removed. I would never question Mr Patterson because he was like God. So he was right, he knew what he was on about. In Birmingham, Patterson was by now recognised as a celebrity surgeon. He dined in Michelin-starred restaurants, drove expensive cars, and entertained GPs in private boxes at football and rugby matches. He lived in this house in Edgbaston, one of the smartest postcodes in the city. Though much of his income came from private work, Patterson was also the lead breast clinician at the NHS's Solihull Hospital. Hemant Ingle raised concerns about Mr. Patterson's practices as soon as he began working alongside him at Solihull Hospital. He is telling his story on television for the first time. His name, Mr. Patterson's name in that area in those ways was such that he was the best surgeon and he used to call himself internationally renowned surgeon. That was his fame. And I started working on 1st of January 2007. First day in the meeting, Mr. Patterson, he didn't even bother to look at me. When the meeting finished, I approached to say, uh, shake, put, put my hand further, Mr. Patterson, I'm Mr. Ingle. And the first comment was, you shouldn't have been appointed. We don't need you. And that was day one? That was day one. Both men would meet regularly at an MDT, or multidisciplinary team meeting. This is where the breast consultant and all the relevant medical experts meet and decide the treatment plan for a patient. Interestingly, at Soliel, when we were used to have our MDT, only person who will dictate for his patient is Mr. Patterson. Nobody else was allowed to say anything. He will railroad through that this is how the treatment is going to be. And so many times I felt that he's advising patients uh, reconstruction surgery quite unnecessarily. Almost every MDT we used to have fight. One day I remember his remark after objecting to the case that he wanted to reconstruction, and I said, no, this is not appropriate. He turned around and said, what the bloody hell is wrong with you? But except me, nobody else in the MDT was objecting. One day, Mr. Patterson suddenly said, I'm away in two weeks' time, and this is a case. This is a precancerous condition, so why don't you do mastectomy and reconstruction? 
and on, I still remember on that day thinking, actually, you know what, he might be a little bit difficult person to work with, but he's actually giving me his own theatre. So all I said, yeah, absolutely fine, even I have no problem. Can we just look at the histology? Histology is a report on a sample of breast cells to check if they are cancerous. Operating without checking the histology would go against NHS guidelines. When I asked for this, he turned around and said, God, you know, he literally make a cryptic comment to say, huh, wasted surgeon, wasted theatre, you know. And I had to say, yeah, can you just stop? You know, I need to look at the histology properly. The worst thing is, if I had gone ahead, I would have completely undertaken a mastectomy for no reason. This person did not need any surgery. The histology was completely benign. Why was somebody asking me to do surgery when there was no cancer? Mr. Ingle started writing letters to senior managers in the NHS. In 2007, I wrote four letters concerning the patient management and at least another four letters, including a big document with a discussion between me and Mr. Patterson about how he sort of threatened me, that if I complain, I will lose my job. So there were at least eight letters within those eight months. Mr. Ingle's letters of complaint prompted managers in the NHS to commission a report into Patterson. Carried out by another consultant, it found that Patterson had undertaken incomplete mastectomies and had also recommended inappropriate breast reconstruction. The report concluded that Patterson should work briefly under supervision and respect colleagues at MDT meetings. But it wasn't shared with Solihull's breast care team, the NHS board, or the private hospitals Patterson also practiced at. Instead, it was kept confidential, and Patterson was allowed to carry on in both the NHS and private practice. Mr. Ingle was moved to another hospital. If he was stopped at that time and all the cases were reviewed, he wouldn't have been able to continue doing the work that he was doing for another four years when he was actually suspended. I was in the shower, washing, and I come across something just in the areola of my left nipple. We had private health care, so my GP sent me to see Ian Patterson at Parkway. He asked me if there was any cancer in the family, and I let him know that I lost my mum to cancer when I was about seven. He said, I think what will help us is if we have a fine needle biopsy. I told him I was nervous about surgery uh, because I'd had a gallbladder removed, been touch and go a couple of times and I was in intensive care and stuff like that. I came back the next week, instantly knew something wasn't right because alongside him was Beth Ann. I recognised her as a, as a breast care nurse. Mr. Patterson said that I was going to get cancer in that breast if I didn't have surgical treatment. Patterson claimed that John had a condition known as ADH, which can increase the chances of breast cancer. It later emerged that Patterson had been diagnosing six times more ADH than the NHS average. Third trip was admission for the lumpectomy. I was lying there in the gown and socks. I was wound up like a spring and I went into a full scale panic attack and I got myself dressed and I think word must have got through to Mr. Patterson that he had a, a patient that was really distressed and in the middle of his list, uh, and I know that because he had blood splatters on his, on his scrubs, 
uh, and on his shoes, I remember, <laughs> um, uh, came in. And at this point, I was taking comfort from a little corner behind the wardrobe <laughs> in the room in bits. He was a little bit grumpy and said, look, how about you come in same time next week and as soon as you're across the threshold, my anaesthetist will come here and will give you some happy juice. But Patterson had convinced him to have an unnecessary operation. He knew John didn't have cancer at all. So I signed the yellow consent form. I came back the next week. As soon as I walked through the door, I was given medazolam. That's when things got very strange and very scary. Diagnosed with breast cancer, Debbie was treated in Parkway Private Hospital by the consultant Ian Patterson. It was 2005. I was feeling so much better, starting to get my life back. I always said to Bob, when I get stronger, back on my feet, we're going to take the trip of a lifetime. We're doing Route 66, and that's what we did. It was amazing, totally amazing. Patterson had me coming back for regular checkups every 12 weeks. Then on one of the checkups, he said he noticed something on my lung, something he didn't like. I had um, what he termed as a nodule of dubious suspicion on my right lung. And he read it to me straight out. My dad had died of uh, lung cancer. And I looked at him and I could feel myself well enough, but I thought, I've got lung cancer. I must, must be the start of lung cancer. I went out to get um, dressed, who had examined me, came back and I, he could see I'd been crying. He went, what, what's wrong with you? Ethan Lloyd Owen was there and he said, well, you know, he's laughing. What, what's wrong? Why are you so upset? Um, Beth and said, oh, I've never seen you this upset, Debbie. I said, you've just told me I've got a, a, a nodule of dubious suspicion. I'm right lung. And he, and he went, that, that doesn't mean it's a problem. It means it isn't a problem. I said, well, how am I supposed to know that? It was playing on my mind and I actually said to him at that time, put it in writing, there's nothing wrong with me. Despite the possible health risks, Patterson sent Debbie for five full body scans even though she didn't need them. Like Debbie, he told many patients he had operated on that they would need years of extra checkups. At the return appointment, we walked into the room and it was grim-faced Mr. Patterson again. I can, I can see the scene, um, Patterson and Beth Ann standing side by side. He told me that it may have actually been a little bit worse than he thought it was. Patterson told John the lump was cancerous. In fact, he knew it was benign. What he said was that the, the best thing in my interests uh, would be to have the double mastectomy. And that was, <laughs> that was some news. It was described to me as, as something that I had to do. I remember standing up in, and, and looking at myself in the mirror after the double mastectomy and just seeing these two red scars instead of nipples. He said, I was cured, I didn't need chemo. 
He told me that I had to keep an eye on my pancreas and my prostate and get that checked every six months. And he checked my prostate on a number of occasions. But because of his quick intervention and decisive action, Ian Patterson was very clear in the fact that he had been my saviour. We're coming into Soli Hall, a lot of money in these areas. As you can see by the size of the houses, um, it's quite an affluent area. And Patterson would look at the notes on the patient's uh, records. If they had a, an affluent postcode, he'd suggest that they should be treated in the private sector because it would take too long in the NHS to be seen. He basically exaggerated the waiting times in the NHS to get those patients to go private. Uh, he figured they'd have private health care. So um, we're coming up to Parkway shortly. Um, this is where I came first to see Patterson. It's just there on the right. When you came in to see Mr. Patterson, you walk through, you're greeted by Beth and she'd call you through. She'd have a little chat. In 2007, Parkway and Little Aston, along with 23 other private hospitals, were acquired for almost one and a half billion pounds and became Spire Healthcare. That same year, Hemant Ingle rented a room and also started private clinics at Spire. At first, he managed to avoid Ian Patterson. I started realizing that it was such a strong influence of Mr. Patterson, along with the breast care nurse Bethan, that it was almost impossible to get any cases. What my colleague then mentioned, that most likely, mo most of your patients will be taken over by Bethan and given to Mr. Patterson. On a Friday afternoon, he would be having between 20 to 22 patients in a private clinic, which is unheard of. I remember one day when I had a small case to do, and I went to theatre to book that case. The coordinator who was looking at it, she said, no, 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 you can't have that. Well, this is Mr. Patterson's list. There were already six cases on that list. And I was really surprised that even in NHS, we don't get that many cancers that will operate within one week in one clinic. And I wonder whether all these cases were actually cancer. I first met Ian Patterson in 2009 or 2010 at a meeting of breast surgeons in Birmingham. And the most surprising thing was, A, I, I had never heard of this other Scottish breast surgeon who worked in Birmingham, but B, he seemed to have some kind of control over all the other surgeons round the table, and they were really scared to talk or to answer my questions. When challenged, he, he became quite brusque and arrogant and defensive and rude. And, and so he wasn't used to being challenged. So I would say that in terms of the, the private sector picking this up earlier, I think the one thing that, that leaps out is, is just the number of so-called breast cancer operations that were being done on a weekly basis. Um, just from the sheer numbers, any, any experienced breast surgeon would just say that's not possible. There would not be that many people with breast cancer in Birmingham under Ian Patterson's care in any one week. The numbers just don't add up. Patterson was able to treat his breast care patients as he wished at Spire's private hospitals without being challenged. Their multidisciplinary team meetings were either not in line with national guidance or non-existent. The only time we ever discussed cases was in, in these rather strange multidisciplinary team meetings that weren't really multidisciplinary team meetings. Uh, because they didn't have the pathologist, they didn't have the radiologist. Uh, the breast care nurse, I, Bethan, was there. It was usually Bethan and, and himself. Since 
some of his patients didn't have cancer. He really would not want have wanted to have the pathologist saying, well, this isn't a cancer. In 2009, two GPs complained to Spire that their patient had been told by Patterson that they needed cancer surgery when there was no evidence of the disease. They asked Spire for an urgent audit into Patterson's work to be conducted by an independent breast consultant. Instead, Spire allowed his nurse, Bethan, to investigate Patterson. She made a presentation and exonerated him. That same year, Bethan did Mr. Patterson another favor. In 2009, Bethan came to us and said, why don't you have him as your patron of Breast Friends? And we all thought, what a brilliant idea. So this is latest news, Breast Friends patron. We are delighted to announce that Mr. Ian Patterson has kindly accepted Breast Friends' invitation to become our patron. We're sincerely grateful to Mr. Patterson for his tireless work behind the scenes in supporting Breast Friends Solihull and look forward to working with him in the role as patron to further raise the profile of our charity. It was like in the press, it, was, it gave him a really good um, image of somebody that was doing good in the community. Before my 40th birthday, I discovered a lump in my breast. Because I had private health care, I went to see Ian Patterson. He was lovely, he was delightful. I remember him in his pinstripe suits. I remember on one occasion that we'd gone in and we were talking about the cars that were parked outside and he said that he was driving an Aston Martin at that time. And my other half said how much he liked Aston Martins and Patterson threw him the keys and said, take the car for a spin while Nicola's going upstairs to have her examination. He said he was very concerned about the lump that they'd found. The following morning, um, I went for a biopsy and um, I then had to wait a whole week for the results. My husband, Ian, had diabetes and was having dialysis. We didn't want to tell our daughter what was going on because she was naturally uh, very concerned about her father's health. So we kept that from her. Ian Patterson knew how ill my husband was and he knew how much I needed to survive in case anything happened to my husband. The biopsy results came back benign. But once again, Patterson told Nikki it would become cancer. Fearing it might spread, she agreed to be operated on immediately. When I went into the room, Ian Patterson said to me that he had successfully removed the lump. Um, it was a fast and aggressive lump that he'd managed to catch in time. He needed to keep an eye on various different nodules and lumps that had appeared on the scans. He put um, the fear into me for the entire time that I had to keep going back to have the examinations. In the same year, Spire published on its website a price list with special breast care packages on offer. Top of the list of surgeons was Ian Patterson. The striking thing is that when I look at all his surgical training, I cannot see that he trained in a breast unit for any significant period of time. All his research activity was in general and vascular surgery. He wasn't trained to be a consultant breast surgeon uh, and he really wouldn't have had any of the skills to do with diagnosis or treatment or breast screening or breast reconstruction to be able to treat those patients properly. By 2009, Patterson was the main breast consultant at the NHS's 
Solihull Hospital. The trust finally began a recall of Patterson patients with suspected problematic mastectomies, even though Mr. Ingle had first raised concerns two years earlier. However, one of the people they asked to select the patients was Patterson himself. Once again, no problems were uncovered. Then in 2010, a new CEO took over at the NHS Trust and decided to send letters out to hundreds of patients Mr. Patterson had operated on. News of these letters soon broke in the local press. At Spire, Patterson carried on as before, but his patients started to worry. So a woman um, sent an email to her breast friends, basically saying, ask the right questions. My email to the committee then was, I've read the newspaper articles, this has arrived from this woman, and I won an extraordinary meeting to go down the path of asking why patients were being recalled and what it meant. But the whole meeting got quite nasty, quite quickly. Bethan was like standing her ground and saying, Data shows that Patterson's reoccurrence rates are better than other consultants. He operates on more people, his rates are better. This is all nonsense. Yet again, Beth Ann managed to calm the storm. One of my cousins had mentioned about um, Mr. Patterson and a story about him and I went, oh, it's just gossip. You know, I'm, I'm not taking any notice of that. Despite growing concerns about Patterson, he was still running his clinics at Spire. By now, Carol had been operated on by him seven times and her private insurance had run out. So she and Barry were paying to see him at Spire out of their own savings. At the time, we'd got the kids, grandkids, they could have done with that money. But obviously we were thinking, cancer, cancer, you know, this one is gonna be it. But in May 2011, the NHS finally decided to suspend Ian Patterson while they continued investigating. It took another three months for Spire to do the same. Some of his patients were sent to see Mr. Ingle instead. Every patient was an eye-opener. Once I started reading the nose, it was a Pandora's box, and that box just kept on opening. And again, I was very surprised that these patients would have a very small, what is called a fibroadenoma, which is a benign lump to the breast. And without biopsy, they would go straight to theater. He had coded them as cancer, but none of these cases had cancer. With Patterson suspended on full pay, Mr. Ingle and two of his colleagues were now able to take their evidence to Spire's management. We actually wrote a letter of complaint to Spire to say there is big mismanagement going on and Spire is storing a huge problem for themselves. There are so many unnecessary surgeries and unnecessary investigation being done in this place. I've seen a number of cases where when it's a benign tissue in the breast and patient was un had undergone wide excision, which was a cancer surgery, very difficult letter to write. At the end of the day though, I wasn't appointed for myself, I was appointed for my patients. Once I found out that the patients were being maltreated and mistreated, either then I become party to that mistreatment or I take a stand and say, sorry, this is not acceptable. I will keep on writing as long as this is sorted. And that's all I was doing. And then later on, what I heard that he had convinced management that I'm doing all this because I want his private practice. Later in 2011, Patterson was subject to an internal investigation, but Spire still hadn't told his patients. I went for one of my regular checkups, um, expecting to see Mr. Patterson, and was greeted by another consultant who told me Patterson had been suspended. 
So I turned up to the clinic for a routine appointment and Bethan was there and I was told that um, Mr Patterson was suspended from doing general surgery, he wasn't working, but no explanation, real explanation was given at that point. It was a huge moment when the consultant told me that Patterson had operated on me unnecessarily and he could discharge me there and then and that there was no need for me to come back anymore. I was relieved I hadn't got cancer, but I didn't understand why I'd been operated on and what the procedures had really been for then. I went out to the car park and just cried. He knew that my husband was clearly unwell and he honed in on that fear and vulnerability. And sadly, he died in 2015. 450 patients who were treated privately by Mr. Patterson between 2004 and 2011 are now being contacted. My wife, Catherine, reads something in the Birmingham Post and she made the phone call. I was invited in for a review I thought that, oh, well, this didn't apply to me, but I'll go along anyway and see what's what. And that was one of the most extraordinary meetings of my life. Today it's emerged that women Mr. Patterson operated on at two private hospitals run by Spire Healthcare in Solihull are now being contacted after the hospital found problems with Mr. Patterson's operations on women with benign tumours going back to before 2004. In 2012, Spire recalled 76 Patterson patients to review their treatment. One of the first to be recalled was Carol, who was operated on by Patterson seven times. The day I was recalled, Dr Ingalls spoke to us and said, do you know why you're here today? And we said, we thought it was people jumping on the bandwagon. Basically, we were sticking up for Mr Patterson and thought that was wrong and saying nasty things, which people can. She came in and said, well, I have no idea why I've been called. He's operated me on me a few times. And then basically, I'm very happy. He treated me very well. And he made sure that I remain healthy. He said, we've read your notes. And are you going to believe that you didn't need to have one lump removed? And I showed her that she had seven different surgeries and none of the surgery was necessary. It's, it's, so we, we just burst into tears, and so he was really upset as well. Somebody going through seven surgeries, tolerating all that, and then I'm suddenly telling her, uh, and when she cried, yes, I think my emotion must have been flooded that day. I did cry with her. You take the word of a doctor and trust a doctor, and expect them to be truthful with you. You don't expect them to be removing lumps that should never have been removed. Why would you do that? But Carol was one of very few patients who were recalled. Others were left to find out the truth themselves. John Ingram's wife had read an article in the Birmingham Post and had called Spire to try and find out what was going on. I walked into the room and this guy, fairly young for a consultant surgeon, was there, uh, seated behind a desk. One of the things he said was that when he read my notes um, and lab results, his jaw dropped. That was the expression that he used. Um, because he could see no reason to justify any of the treatment that I'd had. And I was like, what on earth have we just heard? And what, moreover, what does it mean? It meant that somebody had 
taken me, lied to me, drugged me, and removed body parts from me for no reason. Debbie now also received an alarming letter from Spire. It said, you're a patient that had benign, and in brackets, non-cancerous breast cancer. I kept reading it. I didn't have cancer. Did I have cancer? She'd been mistakenly sent the letter. She did have cancer, but it had been poorly treated. Their record keeping is atrocious. They've lost my medical records as well as a lot of the patients' records. So out of four volumes of medical records, I've got two volumes available. Their initial, almost sort of reflexive action was to close ranks. Notes went missing, people weren't available. It was almost like you were getting drip-fed responses, so a little bit, little bit, which painted this picture of, one, they don't understand the scale of it, or two, they don't want to understand the scale of it, and three, they're not going to address it. That instead of looking after us and guiding us through this process, they were, they were combatants, they were, they were the enemy. Some patients began compensation claims, but Spire didn't accept legal liability. One of the things that people don't often realise about private hospitals is that, in effect, the consultant rents a room or rents an operating theatre from the private hospital. Now, what that means is that when something goes wrong, private hospitals can turn around and say, oh, wait a minute, that's nothing to do with us. We're not under any legal obligation at all to provide you with a competent surgeon. At one point, we had 650 open files in the office, and they had been treated by him over a number of years. That was a huge amount of work, and uh, they were all horrific cases where, you know, he had actually given people wrong information about their condition had recommended that they had further treatment and in many cases had kept them under surveillance for many years when there was no need for that. In 2013 and 2014, two damning reports into Patterson's work were published. One was commissioned by Spire, the other by the NHS. Both revealed multiple missed opportunities to stop Patterson. That should have been a moment back then when government should have taken action and should have intervened. Where the medical profession itself should have stopped and thought, hold on a second, there's something pretty terrible here that's happened. We need to reflect on this. We need to start making some changes. That was the point when all of those patients should have been contacted in ways which was sensitive to the fact that um, something might have gone wrong with their care. Debbie had dozens of traumatised patients contacting her. We want justice. We want justice. And all this has come because it was a culture of greed with Inspire. They put the consultant first and didn't put the patient first. It became clear that some of Patterson's procedures were criminal and West Midlands police started to gather evidence. I was interviewed by West Midlands police and when I heard that this was leading possibly to a prosecution, I was very willing to be a, uh, a witness. The police spent years investigating, speaking to hundreds of patients and their families. In 2017, the trial finally began in Nottingham Crown Court. Ten witnesses were called. All of them were private patients. I went in and I'd been warned he'd managed to wangle and that he didn't have to sit in the dock. What did you see? I had nothing. Dead eyes. I saw him in court and I looked him in the eye and on, on more than one occasion and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to show him that I wasn't afraid of him. I knew what he'd done. 
um, that he was evil. Many, many times when points were being made, he was shaking his head and harumphing and shifting in his seat. And then behind me, two, two rows behind me, was Bethany Lido and his nurse. So I looked around and she'd seen me, I hadn't seen her. And she just went bright red and looked the other way. When we got back for sentencing, he was sat next to his daughter and I, they were reading out the counts. Count one, guilty, count two, guilty, etc. I sat there and I, I, I looked and I was looking for it, some kind of motion, emotion, and, and, and some kind of repentance for what he'd done. And, and all, all he did was, as if to say, I'm, I'm innocent. You know, I haven't done anything. He's never, ever admitted guilt. What, what is going on in your mind? You know, what the hell is going on in your mind? Mr. Pastor, have you got anything to say to your former patients? Any reasons why? All they want to know is why, Mr. Patterson. Have you anything to say to them at all? What happened? What went wrong? Patterson was found guilty of 17 counts of wounding with intent. He was later sentenced to 20 years in prison. Four months after he was convicted, his breast care nurse, Bethan, suddenly passed away. She was under investigation at the time by the Nursing and Midwifery Council. Spire accepted they'd missed opportunities to stop Patterson. They paid out £27 million in compensation. Yet they took no further steps to investigate if he had harmed more of their patients. Nor was the government questioning how this had been allowed to happen. Government should have seen the court case, should have seen what happened and intervened immediately and said, we need to have a full public inquiry here. But that didn't occur. I was asking straightforward questions of Spire. How many, where are the numbers? We couldn't get answers out of Spire. Debbie started campaigning for an inquiry. People were talking to me, telling me their stories, which was then building a picture of what was actually happening. I, don't tr I try not to think about him on a daily basis. I mean, you've just got a reminder on a daily basis, haven't you, when you stand in front of your mirror, especially one in my bedroom that's a full-length one, so... I, d I don't... You know, I used to only see the scars, I don't see that now. So I've got a scar around there, scar from hip to hip, scar under my arm. So all that scarring, when I, I had a less than two centimetre tumour, I want changes. I, I'm more angry. I'm driven. I'm driven by the fact that you're not going to get away with it, and and hopefully your cronies won't get away with it. We want something to drastically change so that the processes, procedures, systems that allow this to happen, and we don't want a witch hunt, they are addressed. In the private sector, we haven't got any figures, we haven't got the data for those patients that were involved. I want the facts about those unnecessary operations to be told. After Debbie and a group of survivors secured a meeting at the Department of Health, they finally agreed to an independent inquiry. The man heading the inquiry into one of the biggest medical scandals of modern times, the Bishop of Norwich, was today meeting with some of the many victims of Ian Patterson. The thing that's really struck me, even in these first weeks, is just the sheer numbers involved. Over the next two years, Debbie persuaded patients to talk to the Bishop's inquiry about Patterson. Hundreds came forward and many spoke publicly for the first time. Oh, he was so nice, so charming, so polite. I was told that he was one of the best doctors in his profession. Why would he want to operate on a pregnant woman who hasn't got cancer? They knew about him. Why didn't they stop him? In 
independent inquiry into a breast cancer surgeon who carried out hundreds of unnecessary operations is publishing its findings today. Many of Ian Patterson's patients were left disfigured after undergoing surgery at both NHS and private hospitals in the Midlands. He was jailed for 20 years. I was awake at half two this morning, feeling quite nervous reading the messages. Um, not so much nervous, a bit emotional. Hard. I look back and I think you betrayed all of our trust, you know. He groomed us as a group. Uh, he groomed individual patients, but he groomed our group, for sure. We've got a life sentence because we'll never, ever get that out of our heads, what's happened to us. This would be tragic enough if it was simply about a rogue surgeon, but it's much more than that. It's the story of a healthcare system which proved itself dysfunctional at almost every level when it came to keeping patients safe. Opportunities to stop him were missed time after time. To a surprising degree, he was hiding in plain sight. Patients were let down again by wholly inadequate recall procedures in both the NHS and the private sector and I've just met many people who have suffered as a result of that. Okay, what was really, really shocking were the numbers of patients affected. So, um, for example, in the NHS and private sectors, instead of us talking in hundreds, you're talking over 6,000 patients, classes and patients. So huge numbers. Does the fight still go on though for you? The fight goes on until legislation's changed. I'm, I'm Debbie Douglas. This is probably one of the biggest medical scandals ever to have hit this country. There have been thousands and thousands of patients affected, but also their family members as well. Ten years after Patterson stopped practicing, Spire finally reviewed each patient's care and put them in touch with solicitors. Over 4,000 people have recently been recalled by Spire. We are still receiving cases and I think they will come in for a long time to come, to be honest. The cases that we're getting now are not only for the breast lumps that people have had and had unnecessary treatment, but we've also got cases for hernias, varicose veins, and uh, things that we, we didn't receive many cases for before. For some, it was the first contact they'd had with Spire in over 10 years. When he came into the room, I remember he hadn't even sat down and he said, yes, it's, it's cancer. I was seen on the Monday and on Wednesday, I was in hospital having what resulted in a third of my breast removed. I was told that I needed a course of radiotherapy and it was arranged for me. I think it was 17 treatments I had. How do you feel um, after you reviewed in 2012? I attended a recall clinic organised by Spire uh, I was told that that had, had been wrongly labelled as having breast cancer. Quite frankly, it was, it was an awful lot to take in. Were you offered any kind of counselling then, or you said no, no support whatsoever? None whatsoever. And that's why I was very angry when I got the generic letter from Spire in early 21. There was serious shortfall in terms of the covenants that was in place. Of course, he was a major player in that, but then so is the environment of Spire and, and allowing him to do it. 20 years down the line, that, that lady's definitively been told, 22 years actually, that she's, she's been harmed. And it's, it's totally wrong. She, you know, she's lived her life thinking she's had cancer for all these years. I get people come to me that say, oh, mine was only a lump that he cut out, but he told me it was cancer. And I said, no, it wasn't only a lump. You thought you had cancer. All right. <laughs> Hello. 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 Hello.
got the imagitimes of three people out of here. I've had one up the wall there, I've no boy's throat. <laughs> It has affected me. I don't trust any doctor like I should. That's Mr Patterson's fault. One of the operations was um, the lump. To get to it, uh, he um, removed the nipple and put it back on. Um, and I think, well, why? When I look now at the scars and I think there was no need for one of those scars, no need for us to go through what we went through, but why? The experience that I had had a profound effect on my trust of medical professionals with the help of, of some really, really good therapists. I managed to get over it and to a point now where I can talk about it. But I also think his biggest crimes are the lack of empathy, the lack of any remorse and the lack of care for any of his patients. I was expecting to see the government intervening to make sure that something like the Patterson case would never happen again. We're now in 2022, and in that intervening period, there has been no changes to law. And so we're faced with a situation, unfortunately, where something like this could potentially happen again. I was angry that um, suddenly the whole breast consultant body, you know, was under scrutiny but because of the misdemeanours of, of one person. I've spoken to Mr Engel who, who raised awareness. It's an incredibly difficult thing to do, to raise concerns about a consultant colleague. And especially as a new consultant, to come in and do that, I think, was incredibly brave. My gut feeling is if you're right, you're right, and you should stand up when something wrong is happening. And that's how I was always been, I always remain. The satisfaction in looking after a human being whom you have either given a good result or at least given a good treatment, and even after 15 years, they are still on the planet in spite of giving a difficult diagnosis for breast cancer. Did you want to do this, Debbie? Just uh, for the adrenaline rush, I think. <laughs> Challenge. <laughs> and also mainly to fundraise the breast friends. <laughs> one thing I learned over the years that Debbie is one of those. Once she gets her teeth into something, she would not let go. Without her going to the top and asking for another review, uh, none of this would have come forward. She's a very good fighter for justice, and she always will have my support. The natural thing is to say, but why did you do it, Mr. Patterson? Everybody asks me that question. Why do you think he did it? Why would I torture myself thinking about why he did it? I don't do that anymore. He has consequences to what he's done. I want him to know I'm out here and he's in there. And I'm enjoying myself and I'm living a life and he's not.
And if you've been affected by issues raised in this programme, you can find details of organisations that offer breast cancer advice and support at www.itv.com forward slash advice.